My name is Tom Sheck, and this is the International Catholic University course on Introductory Latin. My PhD is from the University of Iowa, and my field was Religion, Classics, and Philosophy. Presently, I am a research scholar at the University of Notre Dame in the Jacques Maritain Center. My research interests focus on patristic studies, that is, the study of the early church fathers, and the reception or legacy of patristic studies in the Western Church. I am a translator of patristic writings and have translated some of the writings of Origen, of Alexandria, and of St. Jerome from Latin into English. The goals of this course are primarily to teach you a brief introduction to the Latin language, but secondarily and more importantly to exemplify for you how one goes about learning Latin. I myself effectively learned the fundamentals of Latin without formal schooling. That is, I taught myself with the exception of my PhD program. This is not ideal but it can be done. After my religious conversion, I encountered and fell in love with the Catholic theological tradition, much of which was written in the Latin language. And so I developed a burning desire to be able to read Latin and to understand this language. I have taught Latin at the university level and at the high school level and you may notice that my pronunciation is closer to classical Latin than ecclesiastical Latin or church Latin. The reason for this is because I essentially taught myself how to pronounce Latin words and had no formal instruction in Catholic schools or elsewhere. I will try to point out some of the differences in pronunciation as we go along. I would like to remind you that six hours of instruction is not adequate to learn everything that you need to know in order to understand Latin. There will be many elements of the language I will not be able to cover in these six hours of instruction. My aim is to briefly introduce you to the verb system, the noun system, adjectives, and participles in the form of a crash course. We will spend the final four sessions of this course reading Latin texts together and analyzing those texts. I would like to say a few words about bibliography. There are two standard Latin texts. One is edited by Moreland and Fleischer. It's a bright blue book called Latin and Intensive Course. This is an excellent text that covers the basics of introductory Latin. And the second text is another classic by Wheelock called Wheelock's Latin. This is the one that I used to teach myself Latin. And this text is actually more user-friendly than the Moreland and Fleischer text in that Wheelock has optional self-tutorial exercises at the end of the book and an answer key to those exercises. So you can learn the material of a chapter and then do the exercises at the end of that chapter and then also do the optional exercises that are provided and then check your answers. And so this text is better suited to one who is attempting to teach oneself Latin. Again, that's not the ideal way to learn Latin, but sometimes it is the only way possible. And finally, I'd like to mention a, an excellent Latin English dictionary called the New College Latin and English Dictionary, edited by John Troutman. This little handheld dictionary has every Latin word in it that you're going to need to know to begin the study of the language. And for some of the sessions of our instruction in this course, you will need a Latin text to look at for the charts, for nouns and pronouns and adjectives and so forth. 
So you will need to acquire some kind of introductory Latin text. Before we begin, I want to share with you a story from the life of one of my favorite Catholic theologians, Erasmus of Rotterdam. Erasmus was a priest scholar who was born in 1466 and died in 1536. While on a trip to England in the year 1514, he met a very pious and learned bishop by the name of John Fisher of Rochester. Later, he became known as St. John Fisher. Erasmus was fluent in the Greek language. Fisher was so inspired by Erasmus' example that he asked Erasmus to teach him Greek. And so, in a period of about 10 days, Erasmus tutored Fisher in the Greek language and taught him the elements of that language. With that foundation, St. John Fisher was able to teach himself the rest of the language, and he developed the facility to read Greek fluently and was able to read the Greek fathers, for example, and to make use of their writings in his own theological work. The difficulty with this comparison is, of course, twofold. First, I am no Erasmus. And second, most of you are perhaps no John Fishers. But I love Erasmus, and I know that most of you venerate St. John Fisher. And so, with these great men as our models, let us endeavor to learn Latin, the language of our Holy Mother Church, and to do so in a few short sessions. Now I'd like to introduce to you the Latin verb system. And first, some definitions are important to cover. Latin verbs without the aid of pronouns have the following elements. Person, number, tense, voice, and mood. Person refers to the identity of the subject of the verb, and there are three persons in Latin. First person, second person, and third person. First person refers to I in the singular and we in the plural. Number indicates whether the subject of the verb is singular or plural. Tense tells us when the action of the verb took place. The simple categories of tense are present, past, and future. Latin has six tenses in the indicative mood. The present tense indicates an action that is going on now. The imperfect tense, which literally means not completed, indicates ongoing action in the past time period or progressive action in the past time period. Although the imperfect tense in Latin can be the equivalent of the simple past tense. The future tense refers to action that will occur in the future. The perfect tense, which means completed, indicates action that was completed in the past. This is the equivalent of the past tense in our language. The pluperfect tense in Latin means literally more than completed, and this describes completed action in the past time period. We use the auxiliary verb had to translate the pluperfect tense. And finally, the future perfect tense indicates action that will be completed before some point in the future and is translated with the aid of the helping verbs will have or shall have. So those are the six tenses. After that, we have the characteristic of voice. Latin verbs have voice, 
And there are two voices, active and passive. Active voice means that the subject is doing the action of the verb. Passive voice means that the subject is being acted upon. Then we have mood. Latin verbs have mood. This refers to the manner or tone or kind of action. Latin has three moods. The indicative mood, which is the mood of fact, declaration, direct statement, or direct question. The indicative mood simply indicates that the action is happening. The imperative mood expresses a command. And the subjunctive mood expresses idea, intent, desire, purpose, result, or potentiality. The subjunctive mood is usually translated with the help of auxiliary verbs such as would, should, may, or might. So with those definitions in mind, and I should also mention conjugation, this term refers to identifying the, the elements of the verb, and we will do a lot of conjugating in these sessions. Now let me introduce you to the Latin verb to be. It's over here. Sum esse fui futurus. This is the verb to be with its principal parts. Sum esse fui futurus. Sum is the first principal part. This translates I am. Esse is the second principal part. That's the infinitive, to be. Fui, the third principal part, is the perfect active indicative first singular, I was or I have been. And futurus, the fourth principal part, in the case of this verb, this fourth principal part is the future active participle. Normally, the fourth principal part is the perfect passive participle. But this is a basic verb. It's essential to memorize the conjugation of sum in the present, future, and imperfect. The present is conjugated as follows. R remember, first person, second person, third person refers to I, you, he, she, it. In the plural, we, you plural, they. And the conjugation goes sum es est, sumus estis sunt. Please repeat. Sum es est, sumus estis sunt. Latin verbs in the active system have personal endings. And these endings play the role that pronouns play in the English language. These endings are on the board here. First person, second person, third person. And the endings are, for the active system, O or M, S, T, mus, tis, nt. You must memorize these endings. O or M, S, T, mus, tis, nt. Notice that they are here in the verb sum. There's M, S, T, mus, tis, nt. They will be present in all verbs in the active indicative system. O or M, S, T, mus, tis, nt. These personal active endings indicate who the subject is. O or M indicates I. S indicates you in the singular. T indicates he, she, or it, third person singular. Mus indicates we in the plural, that is first person plural, we. Tis indicates you in the plural. 
y'all, as they say in the South, and nt and t indicates they, third person plural. Okay, from the present conjugation of sum, let's look at the imperfect, or this is the past tense of sum, or one of the past tenses. It is conjugated as follows. Eram, eras, erat, eramus, eratis, errant. Please repeat when I do these conjugations. This translates, I was, you were, he, she, or it was, we were, you plural were, they were. Eram, eras, erat, eramus, eratis, errant. This must be memorized. In principio erat verbum are the first words of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word erat verbum. And finally, the future conjugation of sum, the verb to be, is formed here. Erro, eris, erit, erimus, eritus, erunt. That translates, I will be, you will be, he will be, and in the plural, we will be, you plural will be, and they will be, erunt, they will be. So these forms are very important, obviously. This is the verb to be. They must be memorized as conjugations. Okay, now that we've looked at the verb to be, let's look at the rest of the verb system in Latin. This is the active indicative system here in this chart. Latin verbs belong to one of four conjugations, with the exception of sum, which belongs to no conjugation. A, a conjugation indicates a system or a paradigm for identifying the verb. And there are four such conjugations in Latin. The first conjugation, the second conjugation, the third conjugation. The third conjugation has a variant form or paradigm, namely the third IO, third conjugation IO verbs, and the fourth conjugation on the far right. The first step in mastering the Latin verb system is to memorize the four principal parts of the verb. The principal parts are given here according to these model verbs and they are the first four to appear. One, two, three, four. In parentheses here we have the present passive infinitive. That is not one of the principal parts, but is simply there to show you what it looks like. Our model verb for the first conjugation is the verb parro. I prepare. Please repeat. Parro. I prepare. The first principal part is the form of the verb that you will find when you look the verb up in the dictionary. The entry will be listed under this form, the first principal part. What is this? This is the first person singular, present active indicative, and it translates, I prepare in the present tense. The second principal part is the active infinitive. Parare, to prepare. The third principal part is the first person singular, perfect active indicative. Parawi, I have prepared, or simply, I prepared. And the fourth principal part is the perfect passive participle, having been prepared or simply prepared. The fourth principal part is the equivalent of adding an ed to a verb. 
So let's review these principal parts. Parro, parare, parawi, paratum, to prepare. I prepare, to prepare, I have prepared, having been prepared. This here is simply to show you what the passive infinitive looks like. Parari, this translates to be prepared. So to prepare, to be prepared, you change this E to an I to turn it into a passive infinitive. This will be our model verb for the first conjugation. How do we know that a verb belongs to the first conjugation? It has an A-R-E in the infinitive. Parare. A-R-E. And that A there is a long vowel. It's a long A. It's pronounced parare. A-R-E in the infinitive indicates that a verb belongs to the first conjugation. How do you know? What the infinitive of a verb is, you memorize it. When you learn the verb, you do not simply learn this form. You learn all four principal parts and memorize those principal parts because they are the key that unlocks the rest of the verb system. You must memorize the principal parts. Our model verb for the second conjugation is the verb moneo. I warn. Please repeat. Moneo. I warn. Its four principal parts are the following. Moneo, monere, manui, manitum. They translate, I warn, to warn, that's the infinitive. I have warned, having been warned, or simply Warned, ed. How do you know that a verb belongs to the second conjugation? There's two clues. First, it has eo or eo in the first principal part. Moneo. Secondly, it has ere -E in the infinitive, and this e here is long. This is pronounced monere. It's not monere. It's monere. This E is long. Another example of a second conjugation verb would be video, videre, to see. So, there's two indications for a second conjugation. Eo, EO in the first principal part, and ere in the infinitive with a long e here. Now let's move to the third conjugation. Our model verb will be the verb duco, I lead. Please repeat. And the four principal parts are duco, ducere, duxi, ductum. Everyone? Duco, ducere, duxi, ductum. And the translation, I lead, to lead, I have led, having been led, or simply led. And then here is the passive infinitive. For, mone, for, for moneo, the passive infinitive is moneri. Again, you change the E to an I, and that translates to be warned. For the third conjugation, and by the way, the third conjugation is the difficult one in Latin. This is the one that causes the confusion. Its passive infinitive is formed by dropping the entire ERE -E off the infinitive and converting it to I. How do you know that a verb belongs to the third conjugation? First of all, it has O in the first principal part, not EO. Simply O, and then the infinitive has ERE. -E. So it's easy to confuse second and third conjugation, but the difference is the EO in the first principal part indicates second conjugation, 
And this vowel in the third conjugation is a short vowel. This is pronounced ducre. It's not ducere. Do not pronounce it that way. It's ducere. That E is short. In contrast with this E, which is long. Monere. So, moneo, monere. Ducho, ducere. The principal parts are fundamental to learning the language. We will continue in our next session with third conjugation IO verbs and the fourth conjugation, and then we will begin the present tense.